makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. U.S. President Joe Biden lays out his pitch for a second term as he takes aim at Donald Trump in his State of the Union address and unveils plans to boost humanitarian assistance in Gaza. The Fed Chair Jay Powell signals the central bank is getting closer to the confidence needed to cut rates. The focus now shifts to U.S. jobs data out later today. Plus, a Bloomberg experiment finds ChatGPT produces racial biases against job candidates based on their names alone. We'll speak to a pioneer in uncovering bias in AI. And of course, as we celebrate International Women's Day, we'll be joined by a pretty stellar lineup of leading women from the world of economics, tech, space exploration, and art. Now, first thing is first, so let's take a look at the European markets map. Again, a lot of what we've seen overall driving these markets has been what we heard from Jay Powell yesterday. Again, a signaling that there is a little bit more confidence from Fed officials to start cutting rates. The big data point will be jobs a little bit later today. I'm also looking, for example, at expectations from the Bank of Japan, which uh, continues to support yen. You can see the FTSE down two tenths of a percent. Now, to talk about the world economy, to talk about the U.S. and much more, I'm joined by a world-winning economist and author Dambiza Moye. Dambiza, as always, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Especially, I'm especially grateful that you come actually on International Absolutely. Women's Day. When you look at the U.S. economy, it's firing on all cylinders, and, and this is productivity, jobs, growth. Is there something that, that makes you worry that in the next couple of quarters it goes south? Well, I think the big metric is where is inflation going? Um, and until we get to 2%, I think that the general sense is that um, we're not there yet. Um, and I think that's really expressed in the views that came out from uh, Jay Powell, and we'll hear more of that. Obviously, we're all waiting to see the jobs report um, to see whether there's more pressure on the economy and to see in which direction. I mean, I think what's really interesting right now um, is that interest rates are interesting again. And I just uh, published an article with the Investment Wealth Monitor talking about this. I mean, in the macro environment is so interesting because, you know, on the one hand, we were expecting three, maybe four cuts uh, in rates, but we've seen it be a bit sticky um, as we, we turned into the 2% uh, goal. And uh, I think that's really what's going to be a, a very important uh, metric. But, uh, Dempsey, I mean, this is like, you, you know, the, the kind of winner takes all. The concern is that if, if monetary policy is lagging by so much, then you, see, you could see a, a big crunch point in like five, six months. So are you of the view that it takes a lot, that the last mile in trying to get inflation down to 2% is the most difficult? Yes. I am, absolutely. And I'm very fortunate. I've been going to Jackson Hole for the Fed for, meeting yeah. uh, in August for the past 30, you know, 10 years. And um, you know, so I remember 2013 talking about the taper. But looking at where we are today, that's exactly right. The last mile is incredibly difficult, mm -hmm. um, especially with so many geopolitical and uh, macroeconomic factors that are exogenous to the uh, sort of uh, macroeconomic numbers that we talk about uh, very often. We, d we still don't know where we're going to settle on uh, Israel-Gaza um, with the ceasefire. We don't know what's happening with Ukraine, uh, Russia. And, there, you know, obviously those types of decisions are being made, uh, uh, you know, around the Fed uh, rates path is, are being made with that uh, environment still very much uh, in the backdrop. So, Debbie, that what worries you the most about what we're living through? As you say, I mean, you mentioned geopolitics. There's, a, a, you know, a extreme concern about polarizing societies. The market goes up, but then we also have different market signals with, like, Bitcoin and gold. Yes, yes. Oh, my goodness. 69,000 Bitcoin. My eyes popped out. Um, so, look, I think what worries me most is growth. We can't lose that growth narrative and that growth story. And there's always a temptation, whether I'm in the House of Lords or on corporate boards, um, to, you know, we're getting dragged into talking about the here and now. And it's critically important to make sure we navigate these choppy waters, whether it's because of macro, like inflation or geopolitics. Um, but I do worry a lot that, you know, we have to continue to remind people of the importance of the North Star. And so, yes, we're all interested. Is it going to be a June cut? What's yes. going to happen with rates? But we can't lose sight of the growth um, narrative and what is being done today to make sure that in the next three, five years we have growth. And right now, if you look at the World Bank and IMF trackers and some of the forecasts, we still have very weak growth on the horizon. Yeah, and extreme, I mean, a lot of concerns actually about the UK and what kind of growth model they should be looking at. You, you sit on the House of Lords. How do. do you see the, the blueprint of the UK getting out of this rut? Well, look, you know, what I think is particularly interesting is we have an election this year. As you know, half of the world, almost half of the world is going to elections. And, you know, really when you drill down, it's not entirely clear 
to me that there's a massive delta between what the incumbent uh, Tory government is doing and proposing and what, you know, a Labour government would do and propose, certainly not for the next two to three, maybe even four years. Um, and so in that regard, that really reminds us of how difficult it is to, to get into a, a growth uh, story. Um, there's a lot of stuff overhang of the debt and the deficits and concerns about inflation. Uh, we all know about that. But I just think that there's not much of a difference between ultimately right. what the Tory government can do vis-a-vis -a, -vis a potential Labour government. But so, is it, so is it always going to be actually U.S. supremacy? I mean, even the productivity numbers, right, in the U.S., is it difficult to, to have another economy that, that kind of counters the U.S.? Given well, it shouldn't the be the case. Um, but, you know, look, there are opportunities harder to find in Europe and in the UK, I'm afraid yeah. to say, um, for a whole host of reasons, regulatory yeah. border, and there's, you know, we are ten net takers, yeah. um, you know, of, as a relatively small economy in the UK. Um, but the US story, it's, it's lower hanging fruit. And as you say, it's where there's productivity gains, their jobs numbers, thinking about technology, the sectors that are powering that economy are so much more obvious. Um, and even though the United States does still suffer from debt and deficits, yeah. we've seen the Congressional Budget yeah. Office forecast, there's still a lot of worry on that. It is the reserve yeah. currency. And so it's netting out with people willing to give um, the U.S. Um, a more yeah. wide berth. So the home bias, I think, I'm, I'm afraid, it does seem to be very much uh, for the U.S. Uh, market. Uh, WZ, you also said on, on a number of big boards. Is, is there a huge difference between the way economists and politicians or policymakers see the world and the pressures actually of corporates going forward? Yes. So I think corporates in general, and we, this is a very well-known story um, of the challenge of short-termism and, you know, quarterly reporting, etc. If you think about the challenges that we face on a very macro level, aside from economic growth and generating economic growth, we still have to think about what does AI do in terms of top line, in terms of the bottom line? How do we, is it going to change business models? Um, but we also think about climate and how we're going to adopt and, and, and really alter the path of, uh, of the transition um, so that the world ends up in a better equilibrium. Um, those kind of things are long-term challenges and I think very often corporations in particular, but more and more politics as well, are being forced to deal with the short term and the here and now um, when we all know that these are very structural problems that require long-term thinking, investment today, but really the returns might not show up for several years. Dambiza, thank you so much. We'll talk a lot more about this and some of the challenges, of course, that the thank corporates you. face. Dambiza Moyo uh, from the House of Lords, economist, author, and of course, he sits on many, many boards. We'll have more market insights. We'll also talk about some of the challenges on some of these boards. Plenty more ahead. To stay with us, this is Bloomberg. Well, still with us from the House of Lords, economists, author, and of course, he sits on many boards, Dambisa Moya. Dambisa, thank you so much for staying with us. Yeah. I mean, what's probably changed everything for various reasons, including structural ones in the last couple of years, is that the cost of money and the cost of credit has been going up. How does that yes. shape the questions and thinking on board levels? Yes. So um, someone once told me when I joined my first board about 15 years ago that revenue solves a lot of problems. And I think that that still applies today. In a world of relatively you know, costless or cheap money, um, uh, businesses, but also governments can do a lot of innovative things, um, things that are sort of more, uh, uh, you know, moonshots even. Um, and, and whether that's on social policy or in real in innovation and technology, um, there's a lot more latitude. Obviously, in an environment in which we find ourselves, not just in terms of a higher cost of capital, but much more uncertainty about where the world is going geopolitically and with respect to AI, with respect to uh, climate change, um, all these things mean that we have to be much more on the defensive um, with respect to how we use the marginal dollar. Um, and obviously that uh, affects a lot of the strategic decisions that companies um, are, are picking up on, but also the changes in terms of operations of how businesses are operating and, uh, and also just thinking about long term uh, in terms of how they think about running these corporations over the long term. Does it mean, Dabiza, that you know, at board level, a lot of the conversations are actually on supply chains, on investments, future investments, some of the crisis points instead of inclusion and diversity? Well, you know, I don't think that there's a, a dichotomy um, between these things. I think we've all been convinced, uh, hopefully, that uh, diversity should be a net positive for businesses. Um, I think what has happened in a cost, uh, higher cost environment is that we're much sharper about how we make that transition from 
you know, very laudable goals of we want more diversity into how it's actually impacting the bottom line. And that is something that businesses would always do. Um, and so I think it's actually good for us to be able to, to, to have a di more direct line and, and thinking about compensation, thinking about hiring, thinking about promotion. Um, how do we actually do that uh, in a much more cost-constrained environment um, and also think about still being able to pursue these goals around uh, diversity and inclusion? I mean, th this is kind of a joke, but it seems like, you know, the two things supporting the U.S. economy, Taylor Swift and NVIDIA. <laughs> I mean, how does that, you know, shape the conversations around the table when it comes to AI? Look, I think AI, and I've spoken about this and many others have also, I, it, I, from my personal sense, it's too early to tell. I mean, I think there's a lot of, uh, you, you, can't, you can't ignore the fact that we have a $2 trillion economy that seems to have come from nowhere, though uh, Jensen Wang always says it's been around for 20 years. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, from a public policy standpoint, we need to think about whether that's going to be, uh, you know, net positive for jobs or uh, how should we be thinking about navigating jobs. For businesses, it's about the business model change. Um, you know, it's not just about is it going to grow more revenues and cut more costs. It's also about does this fundamentally change business models. And I think those, those questions are absolutely being debated, certainly in the boardrooms in which I serve. Um, but at the same time, you can't be so fast to throw a ton of capital at something without there being full of visibility on where it might, end, where, where it might land. Uh, Debisa, in 20 seconds, what are you most optimistic about what, oh, on the world economy? I mean, uh, most optimistic technology. I mean, not just this ability to alter consumerism um, and, uh, you know, it cuts expenses and uh, pr increase productivity, but what it could do for public goods. Uh, the delivery of education and health care, um, I think, could be transformative for, you know, still we have a, a billion and a half people with no access to energy and a sustained, clean uh, basis. We have a lot of people still out of school, still out of work. I just think the transparency that comes from, uh, from AI, promises of AI and technology are enormous, and we should be excited about that, recognizing that there are state actors and there are also uh, challenges that need to be managed. So interesting. Dambisa, thank you so much for thank joining you, us today. That was Dambisa Moyo, of course, economist, author from the House of Lords and on many boards. Coming up, we all speak with Joy Bulamwini, who's been at the forefront of uncovering racial and gender biases in AI. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Well, here are some of our top stories that we're following. And Bloomberg has learned that Huawei and its partner, Semiconductor Manufacturing International, have relied on U.S. technology to produce an advanced chip in China last year. The Shanghai-based SMIC used gear from California-based companies to manufacture an advanced 7-nanometer chip. Now, the previously unreported information suggests that China still cannot entirely replace certain foreign components and equipment required for cutting-edge products like semiconductors. And Congress is moving closer to forcing TikTok's Chinese parent, ByteDance, to sell the social media platform over national security concerns. The House Energy and Commerce Committee voted unanimously to advance a bill blocking app stores and Internet service providers from offering TikTok. Now the company is calling on U.S. users to protest directly to their lawmakers. And a Bloomberg experiment has found that OpenAI's ChatGPT produces biases that disadvantage job candidates based on their names alone. Now, when asked uh, to rank resumes with demographically distinct names, ChatGPT 3.5, the most broadly used version, favored names from some demographics more often than others. This was to an extent what would fail benchmarks used to assess job discrimination against protected groups. In response, OpenAI said that results of using GPT models out of the box may not be reflective of how its customers use the models. Well, we spoke to Dr. Joy Bulamwini. From when I started the Algorithmic Justice League in 2016 to where the conversation is now, it is a sea change. I used to mention things like racial discrimination or gender bias in AI systems, and I would receive blank looks. Now you actually have it as part of a uh, federal agenda and regional agenda as well with the introduction of things like the EU uh, AI Act. So I do think now we're in a place where 
most organizations that are either developing AI systems or thinking about adopting them are attending to issues of AI ethics, are thinking about what responsible AI looks like. And so now we're at the devil's in the details portion, but we have certainly made gains in being in a space where these issues are acknowledged uh, by leaders at many different levels. So what's the right way of regulating this? Again, we hear a lot from you know, parliamentarians or people in power that say, we don't want to regulate anything too soon because you could stifle creativity, but there should also be laws to protect some of these biases. Yeah, so my view when it comes to regulating these types of technologies is really the precautionary principle. So if the technology is being used in a high stakes environment or high stakes application, so someone's getting hired or fired employment, if you receive life saving health care, right, in those sorts of areas, we absolutely have to say if we do not have evidence that the technology is not perpetuating discrimination, is not propagating harms. Precautionary principle means we don't use it yet. I think another really important area to consider when talking about regulations are the definitions that are being used. Because as the technology evolves, right, once you're hearing about uh, predictive AI, now you're hearing about generative AI, all of these ways in which the terminology evolves, it's really important that we focus on regulating and legislating specific applications and not just the technology itself. So for example, if we're thinking about the risk that comes with surveillance or biometric surveillance technologies, you want to regulate that all together versus saying we're just going to look at uh, facial recognition technology. Because the next day, now we're analyzing the way people walk, and then you can use that for biometric surveillance. So if you're so narrow on the technical definition, then the regulations don't keep up pace. If you actually broaden it to how is this technology being used? Is this AI technology being used in mission critical areas? Is this technology being used in a way that governs um, opportunity or could run afoul with anti-discrimination law? Then you're actually able to put in protections that can last for a longer time. Dr. Joy, are you worried that a lot of, of course, these new technologies put the technology before the human? And we've seen certain cases in the UK and elsewhere where even whistleblowers were not listened to because there's a belief that actually anything that's technological progress must be right and must be better. We're absolutely say, seeing this, and I think it's so important that we don't accept digital discrimination and digital human dehumanization as the tax for innovation. It is actually possible to be innovative while being responsible. And I think it is up to regulators and also up to everyday people to put pressure on companies to say this is not acceptable within society. Because absent those sorts of guardrails, we do have a wild, wild west. And without deterrence, companies will continue to push to see how far uh, they can go. I mean, you have a wonderful book out, Unmasking AI. What is the one thing through your research and speaking to people that surprised you the most that people don't know? about AI today? I think one thing that surprised me the most in doing the research is this assumption that nothing can be done, right? And so this overwhelm that the technology is made by these huge companies, a lot of really smart people are working on these systems. And so as an individual, my story doesn't matter. What my book and my own journey shows me is it's so important to share our experiences with AI. So I like to say, if you have a face, you have a place in the conversation about AI. So my story of being a graduate student coding in a white mask and that experience of hiding my own face 
in order for a machine to detect me is what led to this research on AI bias and what led to the documentary Coded Bias uh, on Netflix and the book and other types of things. But it started with the importance of sharing your story. And so that might seem small, it might seem insignificant, but that's one of the biggest things that I've learned. Because when we're talking about the limitations, when we're talking about what's going wrong, that gives us the opportunity to actually push forward for the benefits of AI. Absent that, we're going to have such a huge backlash when people see the ways in which AI is harming them in everyday life that the promises of what this technology can deliver will actually be stifled. Dr. Joy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that was Joy's, Joy Bulamwini, a founder of the Algorithm Justice League and author of Unmasking AI. Now, it is a big market today. We did hear from Jay Powell after two days of testimony uh, saying that uh, the Fed officials are probably being a little bit more confident about the ability to cut interest rates. Uh, the other thing we need to watch out for is, of course, U.S. jobs. Uh, and uh, we've also seen expectations that the Bank of Japan will raise rates supporting yen. Coming up, we talk to the European firm that's trying to rival SpaceX, the rocket scientist and chief executive of the exploration company LNUB joins us to discuss the future of the space race. That's next and this is Bloomberg. U.S. President Joe Biden lays out his pitch for a second term as he takes aim at Donald Trump in his State of the Union address and unveils plans to boost humanitarian assistance in Gaza. The Fed Chair Jay Powell signals the central bank is getting closer to the confidence needed to cut rates. The focus now shifts to U.S. jobs data later. Plus, a Bloomberg experiment finds ChatGPT produces racial biases against job candidates based on their names alone. We'll speak to a pioneer in uncovering bias in AI. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, my next guest is aiming to make European space history. She's chief executive of the exploration company, a developer of reusable space capsules that is trying to bridge the gap with the U.S. and become Europe's main rival to SpaceX. Now, the firm recently signed a cargo deal to send the first European space capsule to a commercial space station, potentially as early as 2027. LNUB joins me now, one of the only and few women in the world to run a rocket space capsule business. Ellen, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, this is extremely exciting, exciting and it's incredible the growth that you've seen over the last 10 years. Can you give me a little bit of a timeline on when you're expecting Nick's the capsule that we're seeing behind you to be completely viable? Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, in terms of timeline, so we plan to have our first flight of a prototype capsule this year already, June, mid of June. Uh, and then the second one, second prototype again in uh, 25. So flights are coming very soon. And then indeed, the first flight with the full scale model in 27, going to ISS, International Space Station, and back. I mean, that's extremely exciting, and especially that you're doing it for Europe. That it, it feels actually from where we're sitting that Europe is lagging a little bit behind the space race. Do you feel the same? Laggy, yeah, you're right. Europe is lagging behind the space race. But if we look in the past, like if you look at the Airbus history, for example, we were lagging behind. And then we said, okay, let's do a catch up, let's be bold. Then we started by catching up, and then we put on the market the A320, which was a revolution. So that's a bit the strategy of the exploration company. We start by catching up. Yeah. Europe had no capsule so far, no capacity to do in-space transportation. That's what we do. So we literally enable Europe and other nations to take part in the building of the new space worlds. And afterwards, so this is our first vehicle that you see, but afterwards, we plan to have a disruptive vehicle so that we can, let's say, really capture it and hopefully becoming, like I said, the Airbus versus Boeing, so the exploration company versus SpaceX. And so you're, you're basically really aiming SpaceX, right? It's kind of like I mean, a rivalry. right now, I think there is the need for more competition on the market. If you speak with private space stations, if you speak also in the U.S. with NASA officials, etc., I think a lot of people would welcome in a bit more competition. When's the first per person going to space with, with exploration? With Nixa. Yeah. <laughs> it takes, so we start with cargo, yeah. because cargo is easier. Typically, it takes, let's say, five to six years to build a cargo vehicle. It takes around about 300 to 400 million. 
So this is also something which is fundable by private investors. We're actually the first company in the world building this type of capsule being funded by private investors. And for human, it takes around about 10 years. It takes around about two to three billion. So yeah, it's not tomorrow. Yeah. But again, if you look at you know, what uh, SpaceX did, within around about 15 years, they built cargo and then yeah. human capsule. And that's what we aim at too. And, and this is so your main challenge going forward, apart from the technology, mm -hmm. is it funding? We've been, I would say, quite successful so far with regards to funding uh, because we've raised around about uh, 72 million USD in 2.5 years, uh, which make us actually the most successful space tech company in terms of fundraising uh, so far in Europe. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's true that sometimes investors, especially in Europe, they see more the risks than the opportunities, while in the US yeah. they see more the opportunities and then it's worthwhile taking the risk. Uh, but this is changing. And the way I present the company is basically to say, okay, look, we are building an infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So you have a huge capex at the beginning. But like any infrastructure, just very few are going to make it. So if we are the ones really making it, then it's worth taking the risk because afterwards, high gross margin and like regular flights coming like every year. I mean, it, it, it must be wildly exciting also to think that this is in the private space. But will politics get involved? Like, do you, do you think about things like that? Or do you just, you know, just want to get the, the first person, the funding, the uh, first person? We do both. <laughs> on, we are very, very focused on executing. Uh, so far, apart from delays that were due to launcher delays, so not our delays, but let's say launcher delays, we've been on track. Mm -hmm. We've uh, been overshooting our cash targets every year since company creation. So our investors are quite happy for the time being. So we are very, very focused on delivering on, on time, on cost and quality. But space is a mix of private and public business and uh, will stay so. So in our case, for example, uh, we had to convince together with the European Space Agency, the 22 member states of the European Space Agency to say, okay, hey, it is time now for Europe to have its own transportation vehicle. And uh, they actually decided that in November last year, They've opened a competition in December to buy for the first time in Europe a cargo demonstration, so a capsule, mm -hmm. hopefully ours, <laughs> flying to the National Space Station and then coming back and being reused. And of course, you know, we've contributed to this political push. And it's very important. And also the way we, to have this equilibrium, I would say, between private funding yeah. and a political agreement, the way we do our business, we ask, let's say, the European Space Agency, the public entities to buy missions. Yeah. And we fund the development cost yeah. with private investors. So public needs to act as an anchor client. And this is also very new. Yeah. It's the first time in Europe history that the European Space Agency is really putting in place a competition where ESA, European Space Agency, acts as an anchor client, which NASA did actually 15 years ago, which really gave birth in the US to the new space ecosystem. So we are quite excited to pioneer that together with ESA and the member states. I mean, there is this idea that it, you know, it's really the American billionaires that are going after this. What's the value? I mean, we have actually also a massive shout out to our space reporters mm -hmm. who went back to a conference and said, you know, we need to talk about sustainability. We need to talk, of course, about some of the trash in space. Yeah. We need to talk about the challenges of hiring and the funding. What do you worry about the most? And is it distracting having so many billionaires in the space? So first, I want to state some words about this, against this idea that it's only billionaires. Um, if we look at, let's say, expression company, we started with 50K in the bank account. I am not a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, first time in the world uh, funding this kind of capsule privately, and for the time being so far so good. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's a question of uh, developing a, a, a technical roadmap and business roadmap which fits with VC's KPIs. Like if you say to a VC, okay, I need 1 billion, and then you need to wait for 10 years, I'm not sure you'll find a lot of investors. Yeah. If you say, okay, I have a 1.0 vehicle, a 2.0 vehicle, and then the final vehicle, it's easier because people can see that you make progress, that you stick to your costs, your planning, it creates trust, and then leverage for, let's say, further investment. Uh, so no, it's not only for billionaires, uh, but I'm very happy that some billionaires, let's say, um, have pioneered a way to do, to do space differently. About sustainability, uh, I think there are two aspects. Is, uh, the first one is space kind of polluting the earth mm -hmm. when we launch rockets, where we build capsules, etc. And here it's like the aviation. We, the industry, we have to play our role, we have to do our part so that step by step we reduce our carbon freight, footprint. And uh, at the expression company, we are the first in the world yeah. uh, to use green propulsion system uh, to fly our capsule. 
So it means if we compare what we do with a typical space capsule using hydrazine, mm -hmm. only for the propulsion system, we have 75% less impact on the environment than a capsule using hydrazine. And of course we need to do more, but like that's, there is a responsibility on the industry to build rockets, to build spaceships in the most sustainable manner. And then what we tend to forget is that space exploration, it's a huge accelerator for technology on Earth, which are good for the environment. I was going to ask, like, why, you know, why did you go into, into space? Why did we go into space? Yeah. Um, I think first is a fundamental human being stuff. Uh, if you look back in history, where we're just like uh, at the very, very beginning of the human race, basically, uh, we started in around about Middle East Africa, and then we explored. We went to Europe, we went to the Americas, uh, we went to Asia, etc. So, and then every time in history. Every time we got new technology, like the ship technology, like the airplane technology, we just started unleashing that technology and exploring further. And I think uh, now what is happening in space, we are kind of a tipping point from a technological perspective, where like, you know, like in the, let's say, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, we had very big ships, we could explore the Earth. Now we start to have very big spaceships, uh, which, are, which are reusable. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow that the spaceships will be able to refuel themselves in space. So it makes space travel actually much more accessible, something that we can do from a price point of view and from a technological perspective. And I think we will just explore because this is who we are. So there is no like, why do you go to theater? Why, why are you listening to music? Just because you're a human being. So that's the fundamental reason. And then there are of course political reasons. There is a race between China and the US, so like prestige. There is also wars. You want to sustain in space, let's say, strategic positions. You want to develop, let's say, new weapons in space. You want to make sure you protect your space infrastructure. Space has become so important for us yeah. that you need to protect the infrastructures. Ellen, thank you so much. I could talk to you all day, but, but, I, but we do need to also talk about inflation. Ellen, you be there. Thank you, uh, the chief executive of the exploration company. Now, some breaking news also just in China actually raising some $27 billion chip fund to counter growing U.S. curbs. Interesting that this comes also on the day of the Bloomberg scoop about China not being fully sustainable in terms of trying to do some of the nano chips. Now, coming up, we'll also break down U.S. President Joe Biden's State of the Union address. This is Bloomberg. Inflation moderating. Uh, the latest round that we have of harmonized inflation is about 2.2%. So in April next month, we will be revising all of our fiscal and macroeconomic forecasts in Ireland. And I anticipate that uh, we will be downgrading our forecast for inflation uh, in Ireland for 2024. Well, that was the Irish Finance Minister, Michael McGrath, on downgrading the forecast for inflation. Meanwhile, the ECB's Holtzman has also said a change in rates may be in preparation. There's more and more, of course, uh, of a consensus from certain European countries that a rate is cutting maybe sooner than the markets expect. Now, in his State of the Union address, President Joe Biden announced the U.S. military plans to establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast to ramp up the delivery of aid and rich rate support for Ukraine and warn Congress that democracy is under threat at home and abroad. My purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. Well, I'm now joined by Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta and our EMEA News Director, Rosalind Matheson. So thank you both for joining us. Ros, when you look at how President Biden did, I mean, this seemed to be the kickstart of his campaign. What will he attack Trump on? Well, it's interesting because he, he repeatedly tore into Donald Trump in his speech without ever mentioning Donald Trump by name, just calling him his predecessor. But this was all about laying out his stall for the campaign ahead because clearly it's likely to be Donald Trump and Joe Biden uh, rematch again in the election. And so what he was doing was looking at Donald Trump's record, both as president and in the aftermath, you know, saying that Donald Trump is still very much a factor in Republican policymaking and their behavior in Congress, certainly the gridlock that we're seeing at the moment over a number of key bills, that he's a factor 
in all of that and talking about the contrast with him and pushing his record forward into a second term, laying out all the things he said he would do in a second term and contrasting that with what he said Donald Trump did or did not do in his first term and, and casting that really as a chance, you know, to promote the US uh, both at home and abroad as a place for freedom, for democracy and for value. So you, you can see the echoes of the campaign ahead. Certainly the next couple of months are going to be very interesting because Donald Trump was pretty quiet last night uh, in the aftermath of the speech. But seeing them on the, on the campaign trail is going to be much, much more interesting in terms of how they're really go, going to go against each other. Uh, Kriti, a couple of things, actually, that, of course, it seems that the you know election will be decided on, which is, first of all, the age of the candidates, but then immigration and the economy. Is the biggest worry that the economy may be doing better than two years ago, but the Americans are not feeling it? It may be a worry for the Federal Reserve. It is not a worry for Joe Biden. And a big kind of stalwart of his speech yesterday was talking about how strong the American economy is going. He's added trillions of jobs, especially through his, excuse me, uh, thousands of jobs through his Inflation Reduction Act, and also decreased the national deficit by $1 trillion. This is relevant coming in the context of just about 48, 72 hours, where he has a new budget proposal coming about how he would tackle the U.S. economy. And that includes adding more jobs. That includes pulling back on the deficit reduction plan and tax more corporates as well. So the money issue front and center, but so much of that is to your point tied to the controversy around the border and how they're going to tackle the Mexican border. He actually named in his State of the Union speech, talked about this bipartisan bill to tackle the southern border, saying within this bipartisan bill, which by the way has not been passed yet, and he said that it was due to pressure within the GOP party. Again, another comment directed at President Trump without actively naming him, but said that this would be something that would give him as the president power to even shut down the border if you start to see an influx of migrants. So really covering the gambit in terms of the money questions. Um, Roz, what can you tell us of, uh, about what's happening, actually what President Biden said on Gaza, said on Ukraine and his commitment to trying to do something? Well, certainly there again, he was contrasting himself with Donald Trump. He was saying that Trump really allowed Putin, emboldened the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, uh, and then he subsequently invaded Ukraine and that only he uh, can push to contain Putin uh, from potential further ambition when it comes to Europe, that Donald Trump would not be engaged in that. So saying he would be acting in, in the interest of the US there. On Gaza, it's a bit more complicated for Joe Biden because, of course, he's been a strong supporter of Israel, but also expressing increasing concern about the situation inside Gaza where Israel is conducting its offensive. And that's with one eye on the electorate at home because he needs both the Jewish vote and the Arab vote. That's not in inconsequential on either side. Uh, and he needs to walk a line there between supporting Israel, but also not alienating the Arab vote. And that's a real risk for him at home at the moment, that sense of frustration that the U.S. has not done enough to rein Israel in. So he was talking about the role of the U.S. there, but certainly with one very clear eye on the U.S. domestic calendar. Yeah, thank you both for joining us. Kriti Gupta there and our EMEA News Director, Rosalind Matheson. And the jobs report later today, of course, go, feeds back into the economy and therefore uh, possibly the election. Coming up, Bloomberg also understands that Klarna is likely to list in the U.S., but the chief executive tells us the location is not yet decided. More of our interview next, and this is Bloomberg. met the criteria mm -hmm. that we have set up for ourselves to IPO. It happens this year? Well, <laughs> I hope uh, that we will be able to make it happen uh, quite soon. And New uh, York? Uh, well, I, that is not decided yet. That was the chief executive of Klarna on the company's plan of going public. Now, breaking news, we also understand uh, from Reuters that the BOJ is leaning towards exiting negative rates in March. This means that an exit could come as soon as later this month. And we understood that they might choose to do so in expectations of stronger results, for example, at this year's spring wage negotiation. So it was meant to be started in April, and there, there, was, there is now chatter that it could be as soon as March. Now, my next guest says the average person sees about 10,000 commercials a day. Now, with daily information overload, how do we consume media without it consuming new? 
Well, I'm now joined by Marine Tanguy. She's the chief executive and founder of the MT Art Agency, a global talent firm representing the world's leading contemporary visual artists and author of the Visual Detox. So, Marine, first of all, congratulations on the books. I know it came out this week. Yes, literally this is yesterday. Very exciting, but also it goes through, you know, who owns uh, some of the IP, who owns the yeah. images, yeah. and how much we look at every day. Yeah, and I think you said it, like 10,000 images. I, I hope you were surprised as well, because I was surprised when I heard this number. And only 1% of it is art. Most of it will be commercial imagery. What do we call our visual world? Is your laptop, it's your phone, it's your TV, but it's also your commute to work. And that's actually most of your time that you spend throughout the day, because at work you'll also be on your laptop. And that is basically like regulated by advertisers. The markets right now, advertising markets, is worth 650 billion. Is in 10 years' time projected to be 970 billion. Yeah. And, and they regulate most of what we become, what we desire, our insecurities, what we want, so, you know? I, I guess the problem is, do they regulate it? So out of the 10,000 images, how yeah. many do I know are commercial and how many do I think are maybe aren't or something posted innocently that actually has commercial value behind it? So most of it will be commercial, and I think most of what people will be consuming on social media will still be within a reinforced idea of you should aspire to this lifestyle, you should consume X. Actually, I would say most of it is commercial. I think art is 1%. I think nature will probably be a tiny percentage as well. Um, and that's really worrying. The reason why is because commercial imagery is built to make you dissatisfied with your life. If you were happy with your life, you'd not be consuming. We know that art and nature is a total opposite. The more exposure you get to those visuals, ultimately the happier you are. And you'll be developing your imagination, your creativity, your visual critical thinking. So it's also, in light of the mental health crisis, the cost that this advertising, this constant commercial imagery is generating. And I think, as you know yourself through global conflicts as well, like what kind of images do we use when reporting on conflicts? Do we, at 6 a.m., are we ready to be confronted with some of that imagery? What is the right context for it? I think it's all the questions as the 10,000 images are going to become 20,000 in just a few years' time that we need to really ask. So, right. are, are you calling for people to actually just much, be much more aware of what they're consuming and looking and how they interpret? Or yeah. should regulators and policymakers step in? I think the book is first awareness. Second, understanding of that language. 65% of us are visual learners, but we don't think we can speak that visual language. Third, taking actions. There are many ways in which they are described on how do you ultimately take actions. Behind the scenes, I hope for policies. I feel, realistically, we haven't consented to being targeted relentlessly in our public space. It's our civic space. I think there should be some form of regulations as we become aware of the impact of those. Um, and I think, again, by 2050, 75% of the images we're going to have a look at will be generated by AI. So there also needs to be another no. question sitting on the rise of artificial intelligence. That's for me, is different because that's regulations policies. No. The book is not about that. The book is about what you can do no. on your own and how you can regulate that. But, but it really goes to the heart of actually maybe needing watermarks, right, for yeah. fake news, AI, but totally. also some of the things that we see that is commercial. Totally. Well, yes, because it, it's your brain cannot like basically process 10,000 images a day. It's just too much. Yeah. And, and, and that level is damaging to our brain per se and it's overwhelming and it's making us desensitized and actually not being able to really process information yeah. properly. Mine, as always, thank you so much for joining us. What a wonderful way to end, of course, the Pulse on International Women's Day as well. Mine Tongi, chief executive and founder of the MT Art Agency and author of The Visual Detox. Now, we'll have plenty more throughout the day. Remember, it's U.S. Jobs Day, not only International Women's Day, but it does uh, have an impact on the U.S. election. And then we had that news, of course, from the BOJ and the impact that has on yen. This is Bloomberg.